Good morning. Welcome to St. James. I'm glad that you guys are here. Uh, welcome to whoever's watching on the live stream as well. Um, let me run through a couple of the notices real quick. Uh, we're going to start a new adult Bible study on Sunday morning. I mean, the, the, the previous adult Bible study will, will keep on going. But Nick Shoddy is going to lead a Bible study uh, through a book called When Helping Hurts. Uh, that'll meet up here in the sanctuary. There's a book that you'll have to purchase if you want to do that. And some of you already have. But if you're interested in doing that, that'll start the first Sunday in November. Get a hold of Nick and... Uh, he can make sure you got the right book, and then uh, I, I want to say that's a five or six week study, and I don't see Nick here right now, but you can ask him uh, if you have any questions about that. That'll start here in a few weeks. Um, also, uh, November 1st, which is a Wednesday evening, we are going to, um, uh, and I mentioned to this to you the past couple weeks, uh, we're going to get together, whoever wants to, for a fellowship meal downstairs. Uh, my community group is going to make food for us. And we're just going to get downstairs, we're going to go downstairs together and uh, eat dinner together. A part of that fellowship meal is we'll have communion together, which is, this is actually how the early church celebrated communion, was as a part of a family meal. And so um, that's what we're going to do. We'll have communion together downstairs. The youth group's going to lead us in some uh, worship music. And it'll be very casual and um, just spend time with each other. And if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, if you... If you think you're going to be there, we're not looking for a hard and fast number, but uh, my community group would like to know just in general how many people are going to be there so we know how much food to prepare. There's a sign-up sheet on the, uh, the uh, back on the narthex there. Uh, just sign up. You're not committing to it. Also, if you don't sign up, you can still come. Honestly, we're just looking for a general number to kind of know how many people are going to show up. So if you, if you are going to be there or thinking about being there, sign up back there. All right, uh, you can read the notice there about the ministry planning meeting. Uh, this will be Thursday, November 16th. We did this back in the spring, and, uh, and people who came to it were uh, all said it was really kind of a cool event. The church came together, and we talked about what we think God has planned for us and what our mission is going to be. We're going to do a follow-up to that on November, uh, Thursday, November 16th. Tom Egebrecht, Pastor Egebrecht from uh, LCF, is going to be with us to guide that discussion. So... Um, check out that notice. If you have any questions, you can get a hold of Cheryl. Uh, that's all I have for right now. Uh, Stacy Stocky is going to come and talk to us. And then we will uh, sing the first hymn. Good morning. This morning I've brought with me one of our Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. It is that time of year again. Our boxes just came in this weekend, so you will have them available in the narthex on display next Sunday. So be thinking about that this week. If you would like to participate, what you'll do is grab a box, take it home, fill it up, bring it back. We will need them back by November 12th so that we can deliver them to the drop-off location here in Edwardsville. Um, but for those of you who are familiar with the program, you'll know kind of what to expect, but we'll have all the information out next Sunday on the table of how to pack a shoebox, what should go inside. This is um, run by the Samaritan's Purse group, and they deliver these around the world along with the gospel message of Jesus. These are for boys and girls as young as like two years old all the way up through uh, junior high, age 14. So be praying about that and considering that, and next week pick up a box. If you are in junior or senior high, please come join us this Wednesday night while we assemble all of these boxes. There will be lots of folding to be done, and we're also having our bonfire here at the church. So come on out, 6.30 to 8 o'clock for hot dogs, s'mores, hot chocolate. It'll be a fun time. Thank you. and death. Christ, Christ alone, Christ, Christ alone. alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to, to Him belong. Who holds our days within His hand? What comes apart from His command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ and with Sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ our hope in life and death. 
but truth can calm my troubled soul. God is good, God is good. What is His grace and goodness known? In a great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore. Continue in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in Your will and walk in Your ways to the glory of Your holy name. Amen. Upon this, Your confession, I announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. You may be seated. Psalm 86. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. 
Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you've made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may, hate me may see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Testament reading for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost comes from Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the morning in Jerusalem will be as great as the morning for Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn, each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the Shimeites by itself, and their wives by themselves. And all the families that are left, each by itself, and their wives by themselves. On that day, there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, so that they shall be remembered no more. And also, I will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanliness. 
And if anyone again prophesies, his father and mother who bore him will say to him, You shall not live, for you speak lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who bore him shall pierce him through when he prophesies. On that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. He will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive, but he will say, I am no prophet. I am a worker of the soil, for a man sold me in my youth. And if one asks him, what are these wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I received in the house, in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire, and refine them as one refined silver, and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God." On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost, and there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day the Lord will be one and his name one. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, second chapter. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ, to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other one a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the sermon hymn. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless made this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood. No guilt in life, no fear. 
fear and death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first try to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he Gospel according to St. Mark, the tenth chapter. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel of the Lord. may be seated. So working through the story of the Bible, once again, God creates a beautiful world that human beings manage to screw up by rebelling against him. God comes up with a plan to redeem this world. We've looked at so many different aspects of that. Today we're going to get to the cross and the empty tomb. And I'm just going to spend one Sunday on, I I mention it every sermon or else it's not a Christian sermon. We're going to spend one Sunday on it. I know it's not enough. We'll, uh, here in a few months, we'll spend uh, all of Lent and Easter talking about the cross and the empty tomb. But today, let's focus on just that. To set it up, and the one way to set it up in the story is to say this, is that early on, there's this expectation that God is going to send a human being to fix the problem. That God is, he tells Adam and Eve all the way back in Genesis 3, Eve, one of your offspring is going to fix this, is going to repair this. Later on, he says to Abram, one of your, out of all the humans, Abram, one of your offspring is going to fix it. Later on in 2 Samuel 7, we find out one of David's offspring, it starts to get narrowed down, one of David's offspring is going to be the one who's going to repair the problem. 
So fast forward to Jesus' day, uh, um, uh, a thousand years after the, pro- uh, the, the promise made to David, the Jews of Jesus' day are anticipating that some son of David would come and do what David did, would be the guy who beat the baddies to kick out the pagan overlords and to establish a kingdom of peace. They weren't looking for somebody to forgive their sins. They already had the temple for that. They were looking for a political and military ruler to come and to defeat the bad guys and to say, now Israel is once again a free nation. The pagans have been kicked out and we're here. God's back in this temple and we're worshiping him. Jesus, of course, uh, comes along and people anticipate that he's going to be the guy. He says things and does things which leads people to think he's going to be the guy. And then, uh, of course, he's a colossal failure. He ends up getting killed, which is what messiahs don't do. Messiahs kill people. David kills Goliath, after all, in the chapter right after he gets anointed Messiah. So messiahs aren't supposed to die. They're supposed to kill the bad guys. And Jesus fails. Of course, three days later, he rises from the dead. And his followers have to start thinking, wait a minute, what does it mean then? Everything that we thought about what Messiah is, everything that we thought his death meant, which was failure, we have to start rethinking it. For the rest of the Bible, there are three main streams of thought that the New Testament writers go to when they want to explain what happened with that whole cross business. He was executed as a criminal. What happened? And there's three big explanations for that. We're going to go through them this morning. Actually, I should say there's two big ones and one smaller one. There's three. The first one is this, and it's the one that most of you are familiar with, but I'm going to spend a few minutes on it. And if you can look at Psalm 86... Psalm 86 is a psalm of David. It's a psalm of the proto-Messiah, the first Messiah, David. And he goes through these three things that he needs, which someday the future Messiah is going to pay out. And the first of these is, is that Jesus, when he dies on the cross, he pays for the sins of the world. So this is in verses 1 through 7 of Psalm 86. Actually, let's us start reading at verse 4. Gladden the soul of your servant, David says, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. So he says in verse four, I lift up my soul to you. Why does he lift up his soul to him? Because he says, I know that you are a forgiving God in verse five, and you abound in covenant love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. David, the first Messiah, knows that he needs forgiveness of sins. This is what Jesus does. Jesus comes and he dies on a cross to forgive our sins. All of us crave this. And you can, you, it's, it's, it becomes easier and easier, maybe the older you get, to callous yourself to the sense of my own need for forgiveness. But it's hard to ignore it completely when you're with other people, when you live life, life with other humans. So this nagging sense that I have contributed to the brokenness of this world, it's, it's almost impossible to get rid of that. There's big cases, big scenarios where this happens. I was listening to a podcast this week uh, uh, the story of um, a guy named Travell Coleman, who uh, from New York City is actually uh, a rapper. His uh, stage name was G Dep, and he was very successful. He recorded with major artists back in the 90s. 19, early 90s, though, before he became famous, he had bought himself a gun and decided one night he was going to rob this guy. So, uh, Nobody's around, it's in, late at night, he's in the city, and him and this guy that he decides to rob, he doesn't know who he is, they get in a wrestling match over the gun, and he shoots him and then takes off running and never knows what happens. Goes back home and tells himself, no way he died, you know. Lives his life, becomes a rapper, becomes very wealthy, but he can't shake this sense that I might have killed somebody. And so at the height of his fame, he tells his wife and his kids, I've got to turn myself in. And he does. He goes and he turns himself in. And the guy did die. This is 15 years after the event. He's in prison now. He's been in prison for uh, almost 15 years now. And he was asked, do you, do you regret like, turning yourself in? Did you think it was going to go this far? And he said, I thought it was going to go this far. When I went to the police station, I thought I'm never coming home again. And I don't regret it one bit. Because I could not live with myself knowing I'd done that. Now, 
what you and I can do is we can say, well, that's not us, right? We're not really bad people. We've never murdered somebody. But if you think about all the different ways you have contributed, like in this huge concert of evil with all the human race, think about all the ways you have contributed to this story. Just to, to, try to be awake to it just for a second. All the times that you've said things that you know are gonna ep- upset somebody, and when you said it, it did make them upset, and then you pretended like you were innocent and you didn't mean anything. All the different ways I've gotten passive-aggressive with my family when I'm in a bad mood. All the different lies I've told. All the different power games I've, told, I've played to, to manipulate people, maybe not in some major way to get something bad and big and evil done, but in small ways to try to get people to like me or to try to get what I, what I want done in the meeting done. Think about all the different ways. And if, if you stop and you think and you don't numb yourself with whatever it is that you use, your drug of choice, to numb yourself, it's hard to ignore the nagging voice that we all are guilty. None of us are innocent. And as loud as we shout that it's not my fault, it's Angela's fault. It's not my fault, it's this church's fault. It's not my fault, it's my neighbor's fault. I can shout that, but the louder I shout it, I've got to realize I'm only shouting loud because I'm scared to hear the small voice inside my own head which says, no, Aaron, it's actually your fault. We need forgiveness. This is what Jesus does. Let me hit you with a few verses here. First, 1 Peter 3.18. Peter says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. All those sins that we've committed, all those big sins that have been committed in the history of the world, Jesus died on the cross to pay for those sins, to reconcile us to God. This is the major thing that Jesus' death does, and this is the major thing that separates what we're doing this morning from every, every other religion and philosophy in the world. Like, there's nothing that you, this is not about how you need to think or behave primarily. This is primarily a story. When we come together, we come to act out and to rehearse. I mean, we literally act it out in the service, a story of what God has done for us that we could not do for ourselves. He has forgiven our sins. We read this at the end of Mark chapter 10 today. There's a discussion about political power and how does it work and how can we get it. Jesus' disciples want a slice of the pie when Jesus comes into his kingdom. Jesus reroutes the discussion to be about his own personal sacrifice for them. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus dies on the cross to pay the price of our sins and to forgive us. This is what we need most of all is to have the thing that separates us from God and the thing that separates us from each other, too, done away with. Now, let me uh, just real briefly talk about what I'm not saying here. Because this, is, this, is, this has been, for, for thousands of years now, this has been very dis, distasteful. The notion that God would become a human being to die on a cross to satisfy some stipulation that his father had. People will say, wait, I don't like this because it's cruel. I don't know if I can believe in a God who would murder his own innocent son. I can't believe in a God who would be so hateful and angry that he just had to blow somebody up because other people did things wrong. This is not about, when we talk about Jesus forgiving our sins, this is not about God being angry and somehow needing to like take it out on somebody so he could calm down. That's a pagan view of God. This is about forgiveness and the way forgiveness always works, right? Forgiveness recognizes that somebody's going to have to pay the price for what's been done, and I've decided it's going to be me. And this is what God does, is he decides I'm going to pay the price. Again, I've given you this illustration before. If I burnt down your house, you would probably be angry with me whether I did it on purpose or it was an accident, maybe if it was an accident, you could, those of you who are very, very loving could find it in your heart to not be angry with me. I would be very, it would be almost impossible not to be angry at somebody who burnt your house down. If I burnt your house down, you would be angry with me. But that wouldn't be the main point. How you felt about it wouldn't be the main problem. The main problem would be is you lost your house. How are you gonna get a house back? And the question there would be not like, well, how could I make you feel better? Please don't dislike me. Please don't dislike, I'm sorry I burnt your house, I just need you not to dislike me. And you would say, I'm gonna have to burn your house down and then I won't be so angry. That would be ludicrous. And it wouldn't work either, you know that. So the point is not your anger. What you would have to decide in that minute is, Aaron, are you gonna give me the money to pay for my house? 
or am I going to have to rebuild my own house? And when we talk about God becoming a human being to die on the cross to forgive our sins, it's not about satisfying the anger of some pagan deity up there who wants to blow something up to get revenge. It's about God deciding, they blew up my house. They burnt down my house. They should pay for it because the human beings did it. But I'm going to pay for it myself. That's what forgiveness is. The decision to take the pain on to yourself, to pay the cost yourself. And when we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, substitutionary atonement, what we're talking about is God paying the price to rebuild the house that we burnt down so that we can come back in and live in it. 1 Peter 3.18, I'm going to go back and read this to you again. It captures this correctly. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why did God do this? That he might bring us to God. He did it for relationship. Now, we Lutherans, other branches of the Christian church that emphasize substitutionary atonement, sometimes we emphasize the legal nature of this, like, okay, God paid the price, and now you're free, you're forgiven. We think of it as almost some sort of transaction where, like, your sins are in this book, and God says, I'll wipe it clean, or you're in a courtroom, and you're standing there, and you know you're guilty, but for the sake of Jesus Christ, God slams down his gavel and says, you're not guilty, and you're like, and you leave, and that's it. Now I'm forgiven. Thank you, God. And God stays over in his deist courtroom, and we get to go roam free and continue our lives. But actually, what Jesus dies on the cross to pay for our sins for is so that we can live with him. He wants a relationship with us, and our sins separate us from him. So you guys know, for those of you who've tried, you've known, for those of you who are praying people, you know what it's like to start to pray and think, I can't pray. I just feel guilty about this. You know what it's like to say to God, God, will you help me to get over this sin? Will you convince me that I'm forgiven of this sin so that I can be comfortable enough to pray to you? Part of this is wrong because God's already forgiven you, but part of it recognizes clearly that it's our fault that there's a barrier between us and God. And what God does is he blasts through that barrier with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and forgives us. All right, that's the first thing that the cross means. I know that's basic Christianity 101. Jesus dies for our sins. I'm gonna give you the second thing, though, and it's less spoken about in the Christian church, although more and more I'm hearing it. And it goes like this. And actually, it was, uh, it's always kind of been there, but it's always, usually when, those of you who've grown up in, in Christian church, you know this is the case. When you hear pastors talk about why did Jesus die, they always talk about to forgive our sins. This is good. This is the first thing that David talks about here. But there's a second thing that, that's in here, and it's this, is that Jesus died in order to become king and defeat all the bad powers, including us. And this is, um, there was a book written in 1931 by a, a Swedish Lutheran bishop named Gustav Allen. And I, I, I can recommend this book to you. It's pretty, it's short, it's easy to understand. It's called Christus Victor. And in this book, he argues that, yes, it's true that Jesus died to pay for the sins of the world, but he also died to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bad guy, Satan, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bad forces of this world, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with death, and to beat it and win. And the Bible consistently talks about Jesus' death in this way, that it was a contest between the forces of Satan and God, and that Jesus' death and resurrection were God's victory over all these bad forces. You get a flavor of this in Psalm 86. Look back down here. Um, verse 8, "'There is none like you among the gods, O Lord,' nor are there any works like yours. Of all the gods in the world, of all the evil demonic forces out there, nobody is as powerful as our God. He has defeated them, and he is the one true God. Verse 9, all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. All the politicians, all the kings and the queens and the prime ministers and the presidents out there have been defeated by God at the cross of Jesus Christ, and their ultimate destiny is to come and worship God. He's defeated them. So we pretend like they have power. It's not so much a Western thing, but demonic forces. Some churches, some, some cultures struggle with this, believing that they have true power. They don't, only Jesus does. Sometimes we believe that the politicians and the movers and shakers have true power. They do not, only Jesus does. He's defeated them at the cross of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 12, 13. It's not just the demons and the political leaders. It's also death. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. And I will glorify your name forever. I won't stop glorifying your name because great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Sheol, or this is the, the Hebrew word for the grave, the realm of the dead, is powerless because at Jesus' cross 
an empty tomb, death has been defeated. It's lost its power. It can't win. There's not a single bad force in the world that can win, including the enemies of Jesus, verses 14 through 17. David says, oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. And now remember, David is the first Messiah. A band of ruthless men seeks my life. They do not set you before them, but you, O Lord, are our God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame. There's not a single enemy of God's that exists that God has not gutted and defeated at the cross and from the empty tomb. It's guaranteed that he's going to win. Now, let me give you a few verses about this one. 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. Jonah read this a few minutes ago. It was the epistle reading. It's, a great, uh, it's a great because it's, it's one of these readings that it's, it's the kind of thing that we don't understand it in 21st century America because it's something from back in the ancient world. Let me explain it to you real quick. It says, Paul says, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Now, God always leads us in triumphal procession. That sounds like, you know, to our ears, it sounds like God leads us and he makes us conquerors, like we triumph with him. It's actually the opposite of what it means. Although we, we do conquer, the New Testament's clear about this, but this is not what this text is saying. A triumphal procession is sometimes it's called, in the ancient world, it's called a triumph. It was a Roman thing. It was a Caesar thing. What would happen was Caesar would defeat an enemy. This happened to the Jews in 70 AD, by the way. Uh, Titus Caesar blows up the temple, takes a bunch of Jewish slaves, well, the Jew, Jewish people enslaves them, takes items from the temple, and has a massive parade in the city of Rome where all the people in Rome are gathered around the parade route and the parade route, it's not floats, it's not bands. It's a bunch of people who've just been captured in war and all the stuff the Romans have taken from them. They take them on this parade and at the end of the parade, they take their leader and they execute him. The Romans execute him. So it's this huge parade where you're just being paraded around as a loser. And what Paul says in here in 2 Corinthians 2 is Christ is always leading us in triumphal procession. Jesus wins. He defeats the bad forces including us. And then he pulls us on parade behind him and shows us off to the whole world as ones he's defeated as trophies of his conquest. So Paul says, he goes on in verse 15, he says, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So here's this parade route. And along the parade route are those who are being saved and those who are dying, those who are rebelling against God. To the one, he says, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. To those who believe in Jesus, the parade of his followers, conquered by him, following along behind him, is beautiful. I want that. I want to be conquered too. I want the king of the world to rule over me. For those who are rebelling, though, it's, it stinks. It's ugly. It's a reminder of our own impending death. It's a reminder that I'm not going to join this parade route because I'm not on his side. But you know that you can't beat the Caesar. Not not. Roman Caesar, but in the analogy, you cannot be God. You will be triumphed over. You can join the parade now, or you can sit on the side and scoff. But at some point, you will be put on parade. It's what the cross and what the empty tomb does. A couple quick more, uh, quick, quick more verses. Famous one, John 16, 33. Now this is emphasizing the fact that for those of us who are on the parade, for those of us who have been conquered, who are the slaves of Jesus now, we have nothing to be afraid of because the one who conquered us is the most benevolent dictator ever. Jesus says to his disciples in John 16, 33, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I've conquered the world. I cannot be beaten. One more quick text this is a classic one, Colossians 2, 13 through 15. Paul says, God made us alive together with Jesus. And now he's gonna do the first meaning of the cross, substitutionary atonement. He says, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Substitutionary atonement. All your sins that you've committed have been nailed to the cross and are now covered by the blood of Jesus. And then he goes to the second meeting, Christus Victor, Jesus the conqueror. And he says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus disarms all the bad guys, including us, and puts them, to, puts them on triumph, puts them to open shame, conquering over them. Well, 
how does he do this? How does the cross do this? It's a king of the hill situation. You remember the game that you used to play, hopefully? Uh, you had a healthy childhood. You used to play king of the hill. You get a, a big hill, and somebody's at the top, and then people will come up the hill and try and knock that person off. And at the end, whoever can stay up there is the king of the hill. Right? And there's this constant effort to go and knock the person off the top, and the person who's the strongest and the quickest and the smartest even sometimes wins. What Jesus and Paul are saying here is that Jesus is the king of the hill. All of the bad forces in the world have rushed up the hill and have been knocked off by him. How? Somehow, mysteriously, by beating him. He's become king of the hill by being knocked off the hill, but by knocking him off the hill, you've installed him permanently on the hill. Now, it's, the analogy breaks down because king of the hill just doesn't work like that. You can't be beaten at king of the hill and still be on top of the hill. And yet, somehow, Jesus has pulled that off. And the best thing I can say here, by way of analogy, is this. Let's imagine that there was some opponent. Maybe it was king of the hill. Maybe it was a golf match. Maybe it was a political candidate that you were running against. There's some opponent, and as they are on top. And you're trying to knock them off of being on top. If you believe that they are beatable, you will continue to try. It will motivate you to continue to try. If you know, though, that I can't beat this person, they'll never, ever lose. And the more I beat them, the more they pop right back up. They are undefeatable. The more it's clear that this person is permanently and infinitely king of the hill. That's what Jesus' death and resurrection has done. It's, he's wrestled with Satan, and Satan's got him pinned. It's the worst case scenario. No advantages to Jesus. He doesn't have anything going for him. He doesn't have any of the prerogatives of glory. He doesn't have any sort of magic bolts that's coming out of his finger. He is naked, bleeding to death, hanging from a cross, gasping out his last breath, and he still wins. You can get God down as low as you can get him, and he still will not be beaten. This is Christus Victor. That's what David is appealing to here. You, God, Knock off all the other demons. Knock off all the other political leaders. Knock off all the people who are against me. Knock off me. Beat everybody. That's what the cross does. Substitutionary atonement's the first one. Christus Victor's the second one. And then last one, and this is a minor one. Jesus' death and resurrection, or it's a secondary one, I should say. It's not minor. That sounds bad. Jesus' death and resurrection is an example for us to follow. David says in Psalm 86, he says in verse 11, he says, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. So in, in the middle of all this, appealing to and praising God for being the one who forgives our sins, uh, point one, for being the one who rules over all the bad guys, point two, he says, I want to know your way. W what does your way mean? Sometimes we say, like, God, help us to walk in your ways. And what we think is, like, God's got a bunch of rules and we need to follow them. And that's a part of it. But when we talk about God's way, what we're mainly talking about is the path that God himself walks, God's way, how he acts. God, I want to know your way. I want to know how you act. I want to know how you think. I want to know how you talk and how you love. And then teach me to be like you. What, what David's prayer is in Psalm 86, 11 is fundamentally a prayer like, God, make me like you. I want to be like you. Now, if God is a God who rules by self-sacrificial love, rules Christus Victor, by self-sacrificial love, substitutionary atonement. He calls us to do the same thing, to also self-sacrificially love others. This one is completely dependent on the first two. I, I, I said it's secondary. The first two are what matters. Without the first two, without substitutionary atonement and Christus Victor, the second is just self-righteousness. Now, we are called to love and serve other people. We are called to feed the poor. We are called to sacrifice ourselves for our families and for our friends. But if Jesus didn't die and rise from the dead in order to pay for our sins and to rule over all things, it's just, it's just empty ritual. Now, that's harsh too. It can be helpful. Like, so when people who don't know Jesus, when they are, when they are kind to the poor, when they do acts of mercy to help people. Is that good? Yes, absolutely. It's definitely good. But, but, but it's, if it doesn't tap into and flow from Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross, it's just 
finite helping finite. Let me tell you what I mean. Um, if, if, if there's a homeless person and I go and I say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a good human being and I'm going to go help this person and I'm going to, uh, whatever it is, I'm going to give them some money. I'm going to take them someplace and get them some food, get them cleaned up. Maybe even I'm going to figure out like, what's the best way I can get them job training and I start to fund that. That would be a wonderfully humane thing to do. And I hope everybody in the world is doing this. But what it would be doing is it would be saying, okay, from Aaron Miller's resources, it's extremely limited, to your resources, which are lower than mine, I will come down and will help you. But I can only do so much. I can't. I, I can't fix you. I, you know, m- maybe I can buy you a meal, but I can't pay for I don't have enough to pay for your dentist work. What I'm doing... And, there's all sorts of complicated things with this as well, including like the position that it puts me in as the middle class, uh, the middle class benevolent ruler over uh, the lower classes which need my aid. But it's only limited what I can do. I, I might feel better about it. Maybe this person will get a meal, but it's, it's finite to finite. But if I go and I serve somebody and I say, I'm not here I'm not here with my finite resources. I'm going to give you, I'm going to take you and get you a hot meal. But it's not about the hot meal. I want this hot meal to be a sign that there is a God in the universe who is willing to pay for every sin that has brought you to this moment and is strong enough to rescue you from all the evil things that you've experienced. If my self-sacrificial love is flowing out of that, the first two points, then it's what God calls us to do. Now, pro tip here. Sometimes you guys will, some of you have come from churches like this. Sometimes you'll go and you'll visit a church and you'll be like, this is something kind of funky. It's like, it, it's, it seems like it's a good message or whatever, but like, there's something missing. There's a lot of churches in our culture, in the West especially, in America especially, which will teach the third one without the first two. Christianity is helping people, helping the poor. This is true, but outside of the first two, it's just finite to finite. It's just weak people trying to solve other weak people's problems. It's just the Alzheimer's patient trying to cure the cancer patient. But with the first two, I can love and serve, you and I can love and serve, those of you who know Jesus, can love and serve knowing that the power behind the greatest power in the universe, the death and resurrection of Jesus, is flowing through you to the people that you're serving. That forgiveness of sins is being made available because you are offering people signs, whether it's a meal, whether it's help with education, whether it's a $5 bill, whatever it is, you're helping people connect to the God with infinite resources. This is what the death and resurrection of Jesus offer, these three things. Forgiveness of our sins, power over the whole world, and fuel for his people to offer that to others by walking in God's way by acts of mercy, by acts of love. So as we continue, and we're going to uh, keep on with it. I mean, the cross of Christ is going to come up every Sunday. We're going to talk next week about uh, Jesus and how he is the offspring of Abraham. We're going to constantly circle back to these points. The death of Jesus is not simple. It does, a, it, it does several different things, all of them important, all of them, in, uh, all of them essential. And so we're going to constantly be asking, like, Jesus, continue to show yourself as the forgiver of sins to us through your death on the cross. Jesus, continue to rule and reign over us, to put us on triumph in you because of your death on the cross. Jesus, continue to fuel us for acts of love and service to each other. Let's pray. Father, by the power of your word, by the power of Psalm 86, Lord, would you direct our minds and our hearts and our attitudes and our emotions towards you as we come to the communion rail now and receive your son Jesus. May we be filled up with him as the one who died for us, as the one who rules over us through his death and resurrection, as the one who through his word and through his body and blood and the bread and wine of Holy Communion is empowering us to love and serve like him, not in our own power, but in his power. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make a wretch 
his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held. stand for prayer. Father, we pray that you would hear our prayer this morning, our, our prayers to congregation, for the sake of your son Jesus, through whom we pray these prayers. We pray that you would meet our needs, and Lord, you know more than we even do how much we need forgiveness of sins and how much we need you to be in charge. The world is a bad place and there are bad people who do bad things, and all of us in this room are a part of that problem as well. And Lord, exercise the power of your death and resurrection to make things right again, to make things new again. Start, and start with us, Father. Start with your church. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank and praise you for all the different ministries that you've called us to here and for uh, the ways we have been called by you to love and serve each other and to love and serve Glenn Carbon and uh, to love and serve uh, your world. And we thank and praise you this morning, especially for uh, the Altar Guild ministry and for Nick, who's in charge of that, and for uh, all of your servants who take care of us by making sure that communion is ready for us and putting the pyramids up and, and uh, loving and serving us in that, that, that silent, quiet way, and that you would bless them and that um, make, us heart, make, make our hearts grateful for this group of uh, men and women, Lord, who... Allow us to come without uh, logistical problems to your rail and to be able to, to receive your body and blood and to focus on you and to be focused on by you. We also pray that you would be this morning with Kevin Parviz and with uh, Kaiva Shalom uh, ministry there in um, Dogtown and that as uh, Kevin and the family of believers there minister to the lost of St. Louis, especially those in the Jewish community that that you would make them a beacon of your Messiah's love and grace and that, that they would be drawn to you because of the ministry and the word that's lived out and proclaimed by Pastor Parviz and the saints there at Kaiva Shalom. Lord, in your mercy. 
I also pray, Father, that you be with those of us who uh, are grieving and are struggling with pain and worry and physical problems and mental problems and that you would meet our needs and that you would give us grace. And Father, the, the good things that you do for us, the, 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 the bits of healing that you give us, the bits of restored relationship that you give us sight of, help us not to rejoice in those gifts just as gifts, Father, but as gifts from you, the giver, and help us to be drawn constantly to you as the God who answers prayer and meets our needs and heals us. And we pray that you would continue to do this until the last day when you make all of us and all of our relationships and all of our world new in you. I especially pray this morning that you'd be with the family of Opal Jones, Vera Parkin's mother who passed away yesterday, and that you would give them comfort and hope and that you'd be with Vera especially and John and the rest of the family as they mourn the loss of Vera's mom. And we give thanks to you that she was uh, a child of you and that she knew your son Jesus and that um, she's safe in your arms now. And we long with her, the rest of us, uh, for the resurrection and for the day when your son Jesus returns and raises our bodies from the grave and Opal's body from the grave and makes all things new again. Lord, in your mercy. We pray these prayers, Father, because you've invited us to, because you've made it possible by uniting yourself to us, by forgiving our sins so that we can be in your presence, for calling us holy, for looking at us and calling us perfect in your Son, Jesus Christ. And so we come as your perfect and holy children on one hand into your presence, asking you these requests, knowing that you will answer them because you are the Father who loves us. We pray these in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's confess our faith now with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally because he's now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing. Holy, 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 all the saints in Now let's pray together in Jesus' name the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. 
This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
sin afflicted, bowed with fruitless sorrow down. Through the cross, behold the crown. Look to Jesus, look to Jesus, look to Jesus. Mercy flows through him Treasure, wealth, 
Please stand. And now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in Christ's peace. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Some of you have asked me if I would talk sometime about how we should think about the situation in uh, Israel. And uh, next Sunday will be perfect because it's actually, even prior to this happening, that was the, the goal of the sermon text. The, the sermon coming from the sermon text is to talk about that. So come back next Sunday. And we'll talk about Israel. Also, I, you, we, we, I know we have our regular beats now where church is over and you leave, leave and you find your way to your normal people. Change that up this week and go to somebody that you don't normally go and talk to and start to build fresh relationship, fresh community. Go in peace. <laughs>